Welcome to the Alex Salmon Show and to the first of a series on British shipbuilding. From global dominance of commercial shipping at the end of the 19th century to new insignificance just a century later. We think of Harland and Wolfe as a famous Belfast shipbuilder, but a century ago they had yards on the Clyde as well as no less than six repair yards here on the River Thames. That industry is long gone as financial engineering has taken the place of real engineering. Now in the 21st century, the UK government's grandly named British shipbuilding strategy is entirely focused on military ships, while the world commercial shipping market of 250 billion has been virtually abandoned to international competitors. In this first programme, we look initially at the views of MPs on a cross-party basis on whether the government will honour its commitments to sustaining a lifeline of military orders. And we talk to the General Secretary of the Shipbuilding Unions, who is galvanising this cross-party support to keep the government's feet to the shipbuilding fire. Over the next couple of weeks, we'll be talking to the people who actually run yards across the British Isles and to some of the workers who build the ships and ask them directly, is British shipping going boldly to a new sunrise or still sliding towards an inevitable sunset? But first, to Alex with your tweets, your messages and your emails. Well, first up is from Chris, who says, Great interview with the MP from Ireland. Interesting insight and perspective. I wouldn't have voted out if I had taken a second to consider the impact in Ireland. Very interesting, Chris. And Joe Garty said, Did I see Ur Alec doing the Tory power stance when he was speaking to the professor on screen last week? Now, this is what uh, Jill's talking about. And take a look at this. Well, sorry to disappoint you, Joel. I, I can't speak for the Tory politicians, but I just had a sore foot myself. And then from Shirley Jean Seaton, who says, the programme covered exhaustively the intractable problem of Brexit and frictionless trading cross-border. I await Boris proposing all monitoring of cross-border trade will be done from space, by satellite, a la container ship movement, and pirates. And then messages from John Scowler and CRN Bob. The only sensible solution is a united Ireland. And then what I would go for is a united independent Ireland, an independent Scotland, an independent Wales, along with England, all members of the European Union. And finally, from Lynn Finlayson, who says, Professor Jonathan Tong says it all. Scotland and Northern Ireland voted overwhelmingly to remain, and the UK government is completely disregarding this. Hell mend them. The well, Helmendum is a great phrase, of course, Len, that means uh, on their heads be it. And now to uh, the first of our series of reports on the, the future of British shipbuilding. At the turn of the 19th and 20th centuries, around three quarters of world shipping was built in the United Kingdom. But now the great names of shipping, Harland and Wolfe, Camel Laird, Ferguson's, Yarrows, have either disappeared or are much diminished. The industry was nationalised as British shipbuilders in the 1970s, but this failed to arrest the decline, with the number of employees falling from 87,000 in 1977 to a mere 5,000 within 10 years. And although it was not until 2013 that the final nail was put in that entity, its remaining assets and employees have long since been dispersed to the private sector. Some great military ships are still being built, most recently the two Queen Elizabeth-class aircraft carriers, but there is real concern that unless the government fully adopts Sir John Parker's report on shipbuilding strategy, it will not be enough to keep the industry on its current scale, never mind the renaissance envisaged by Sir John. Recently, MPs from across the political parties and across the shipyard constituencies put their concerns to the new ministerial team at the Ministry of Defence. Britain is good at shipbuilding and many of the warships on sea trials in dock being built and those being planned are testament to our naval heritage and the up-to-date skills of a superb workforce right across the UK. I hope this debate today will illustrate to the new minister and his officials not that this plan is wrong per se, but that with scrutiny we can make it more robust, more valuable to industry and to our armed forces. Principally, there are two areas I want to highlight in asking for revisions to this document. One in the procurement of the Royal Fleet Auxiliaries vessels, especially the new Solid Fleet support ships, and secondly to the configuration, capabilities, roles and realities of the proposed Type 31E frigate. The House will probably not need reminding that we had more than 60 frigates and destroyers at the time of the Falklands campaign. 
And by the time that my cohort came into the House of Commons, 1997, that number had come down to 35 frigates and destroyers. The shipbuilding giant of Harland and Wolf at one stage, this was the biggest employer of men, not only in the Honourable Gentleman's constituency, but also my constituency, uh, and, and some 35,000 workers at their peak in the 1920s. Harland and Wolf has reduced the ship in, in, around, uh, every 14, in around 14 years. Uh, so so the, 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 they continuously <coughs> provided ships and built ships over a period of time. The last to leave the Queen's Island was the, the £40 million Anvil Point at the start of 2003. So the 22,000 tonne ferry was the second of two vessels built for the Ministry of Defence. Harland and Wolf are teaming up with other companies such as Talis, and, and again in the Honourable Gentleman's uh, constituency of East Belfast, and others to bid for a £1.25 billion contract. Uh, and I believe that not only um, and they not only have the ability, but also have the drive and the desire to deliver the best that they can be given. We are now in a place where the National Shipyard Strategy, when it was announced, was, and I am going to be uh, fair here, I think, and uh, moderate in my uh, remarks, was a presentational dog's breakfast. With the former Secretary of State, on six occasions in the Chamber, claimed that there was a frigate factory in the Clyde. At the same time as he is on his feet in the Chamber, claiming there was a frigate factory in the Clyde, GMB officials were taking Scottish journalists round the proposed site for the frigate factory, which is rubble and ash. So there is no frigate factory in the Clyde, and it led to a presentational disaster for the government. Can I join Ms McDonough? Uh, my uh, support uh, for those already who have spoken that the, there is no need for the Royal Fleet auxiliary ships to go out to international competition. And the reason that no British Yard is yet applied for or, 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 asked to be, or asked to be considered for this is because they believe it will be sent out internationally. That's inevitably going to be the case. Now, marshalling his parliamentary troops is Ian Waddle, the General Secretary of the Confederation of Shipbuilding and Engineering Unions. Welcome to the Alex Island Show, Ian. Hello, I'm happy to be here. Now, you've assembled a pretty powerful cross-party alliance. Are you going to be successful in holding the government to its commitments on this flow of orders? Well, I think the answer to that really is in the balance. The, the alliance that you refer to is really one based on a blindingly obvious argument, uh, which in turn flows from Sir John Parker's National Shipbuilding Strategy Report, which argues that military ships could and should be built in the UK, and that could be a platform for investment in the yards and, and open a whole world of opportunities. And I think that's why everybody's standing behind this. It, it just is absolutely clearly uh, common sense. Now, the government says they're committed to the Parker report, but there's a lot of concern that the, this order for support ships seems to be going out to international competition. Well, as always, you know, it's what's uh, in the fine print. The government says it's committed, uh, but we've got a situation where Type 26, we know, will be built on the Clyde. Uh, type 31E, which is a light uh, frigate, is open for competition at the moment, and there may be a foreign design in all of that. There's a, and a, two alliances of yards in the UK that are bidding, uh, but it's not clear what the destination of that contract will be. The big prize <coughs> is the fleet solid support ships, three vessels of 45,000 tonnes each. That's equivalent to the two aircraft carriers that we built. If we could build those in the UK, that would make a fundamental difference to the future of the ship. That's the fascinating industry. because you know, the aircraft carriers are <coughs> massive pieces of brilliant engineering, but you're saying these support ships, that order is equivalent to the two aircraft carriers? Absolutely. In, 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 ton, in tonnage, uh, afloat, uh, they're equivalent, but they're also complex ships. They will be entering into military uh, war zones, they'll be supplying the carriers with, with engines and spare parts for the F-35 aircraft that are on board, ammunition, uh, as well as all sorts of other supplies. Each ship will have a specific job, it'll be a unique one-off design. These are not like commercial ships that, that are built in South Korea uh, every day of the week. These are really specialist vessels, and the fundamental thing is they're warships. They'll be armed. They'll carry an armed Lynx helicopter. They'll carry parties and marines. That's not a commercial ship. It's a warship. So there's nothing to stop the government in terms of international law or contracts from saying these are warships and should be built in the UK? Well, we, we produced a report um, last week in Parliament which shows clearly that uh, France, Germany, Italy, Spain, all EU countries uh, built similar ships. They all have domestic shipyards. And you know what? Surprise, surprise, they built their ships in their shipyards. The EU rules didn't stop them. The government quite easily could declare these are warships. I think it's absolutely uh, clearly the case, and it's definitely defensible in the EU. I don't know why the government has been so timid 
about this, but they seem determined to put them out to international competition. Now, what's the connection between guaranteeing a flow of work for the yards and breaking into the market for commercial ships worldwide? Well, one thing leads to the other. I mean, 100 years ago, this country, uh, the United Kingdom, built half of the world's ships and has proud shipbuilding heritage right across uh, these islands. Um, we lost that because we didn't invest in modern technology, modern techniques, and uh, yards, particularly in the Far East, overtook us. If we had a steady pipeline of military work stretching out 10, 20 years, then that gives companies the ability to invest with confidence for the future. We could build world-class yards that would be able to com compete in the, in the commercial shipping market. One thing leads to the other. At the moment, we've got boom and bust. Type 26, then a gap to type 31, then a gap to who knows what. And, and the yards can't survive on that, and you can't invest as a business owner. Um, so it, it's the drumbeat of military orders that creates the certainty that leads to investment of world-class facilities. And what, what's the, the, the social and economic consequences of having a, a, a guaranteed skilled labour force in these communities? Well, one thing that we're waiting to see uh, the reality of is um, a prosperity agenda which uh, Gavin Williamson, the Secretary of State, has built in. This is the new Secretary of State for Defence. The new Secretary of State for Defence, yeah, has, has said that he wants to see prosperity taken into account of in the way that the MOD does its business. Now, prosperity for me is simple. If you build a ship in the UK, then the workers pay tax, they pay national insurance, the company pays corporation tax, and there's an immediate return to the Treasury from employing people in, in the UK that you wouldn't get if you built the ships in South Korea. They would get that benefit. But also you're able to recruit apprentices, those people go out and buy houses and cars, fridges. There's a, a multiplier effect uh, in the wider economy. And let's not forget, these ships could be built with British steel. Our steel industry is struggling in the international market at the moment. If we specified British steel for these ships built in the UK, then that could make a massive difference, not just in the shipbuilding communities, but way beyond. So, Ian Waddle, from the perspective of the Confederation of Shipbuilding and Engineering Unions, shipbuilding for the UK, sunrise or sunset industry? Well, I think... The future of the industry is in the government's hands. If they make the right decision, classify fleet solid support ships as warships and guarantee a drumbeat of work, then this will be the sunrise. If they put them out to inter international competition and they're built abroad, I'm sorry to say I think it's the sunset. We'll see yards closing. Resythe could be the first to go. Ian Waddle, thank you. for. I can't guarantee you the, uh, the drumbeat uh, of orders, but I, I can offer you for appearing on the Alex Allen show the quick. Which Thank is you the very much. Scots Gaelic for the loving cup. Well, I'd like to drink a nice Islay malt out of that to celebrate FSS being built in this country. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> when you join us after the, the break, we'll be talking to one of the members of Parliament fighting hard for shipbuilding in his constituency. See you then. Welcome back. We've heard the concerns of members of Parliament across the political parties and the shipbuilding unions about the government's shipbuilding strategy. This is what ministers have had to say in reply in the House of Commons. To return to Sir John Parker's original point, it hinges on the strength of the partnership between government and the sector. It's about our collective ability not simply to improve productivity, not simply to develop the product that the international market wants to buy, but to continue to develop the skills and the talents to keep the industry firing on all cylinders. This was the question the Prime Minister was confronted with a couple of weeks back by Dunfermline and West Fife MP Douglas Chapman. Uh, Prime Minister, you will be aware that in my constituency we are putting the finishing touches to our second aircraft carrier, the Prince of Wales. But as we near the end of that contract, over 400 people in the recite yard are now facing redundancy with many more job losses in the pipeline. Will the Prime Minister visit Dunfermline and West Fife to explain to the recite workforce face to face why our government intends to award a £1 billion shipbuilding contract to yards out with these islands when we have the skills, the talent and the infrastructure to deliver right here. Prime Minister. Here, here. Yeah, honourable, can I say to the honourable gentleman that what we are doing through our national shipbuilding strategy is focusing on giving the Royal Navy the ships it needs while increasing economic growth across the country and investing in a more skilled workforce. So we are uh, encouraging a more competitive industry in shipbuilding and growing jobs across the uh, country. I think he may have uh, been referring to the uh, 
future ships, uh, support ships for the Royal Fleet Auxiliary uh, being procured through international competition. Um, that's three ships. They'll be built in the Fleet Solid Support Programme. They will be subject to international competition to secure the best possible value for money for the UK taxpayer. But what we are doing, what we are doing through our national shipbuilding strategy, is ensuring that we develop that shipbuilding capability here in the UK in a way that we can encourage all UK shipyards with the necessary skills and expertise to continue to engage in that particular programme. And Douglas Chapman joins me now. Welcome to the Alex Salmon Show, Douglas. Thanks very much. Yeah. Now, the Prime Minister, you, you didn't get much joy there, but she seemed to concede uh, that the Ministry of Defence were now putting out to wide tender across the world uh, a range of shipbuilding contracts. Well, that's exactly right. And, uh, you know, when we look back to the shipbuilding strategy, which was only uh, put out last year, uh, you know, a lot of people who work in the shipbuilding industry really thought that the future was looking a bit brighter. Uh, however, this uh, latest announcement where contracts are now going into international tender means that British jobs, Scottish jobs, uh, are being sucked out of ship shipyards and, uh, you know, the future uh, for these workers is uh, looking precarious. But doesn't the Prime Minister have a point? I mean, the range of ships that are, are being put out to tender are, are not uh, ships like the carriers which have been built in your constituency. They're, they're serviceable ships that are required for the Navy. And uh, isn't she right that public money and value for public money is the prime consideration? Well, I, th I think there have been a whole range of different studies done to make sure that uh, when you're looking at shipbuilding, it's not just about the price or the cost of the, the ship you're building, but it's the knock-on benefits that the whole economy can benefit from. You know, I've, I've got uh, 250 people in Resyth who lost their jobs in November, another 150 who lost their jobs uh, in the last month or so, and there's more job losses in the pipeline. That means that there's all these people who are not paying tax, not paying tax, national insurance, making a, a contribution to our local economy and making a contribution to the national economy. And it's actually putting good money after bad if you're allowing these contracts to go out with the, 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 these aisles and uh, when we could be build, building them either in the Clyde at, uh, in, in Belfast or as I would want in, in Resyth. So your constituency uh, containing Resyth, the, the huge naval dockyard it was, has been refitting uh, uh, ships since the dreadnoughts in the First World War. How many people are employed now in your constituency? Well, there's a, a core workforce of uh, roughly uh, 1,200 uh, people working there. As each carrier was built, then the, the workforce is, is not required. And the whole point of the shipbuilding strategy is to make sure that we have the skills, the capabilities, the infrastructure uh, on a regular basis. So it's a steady drumbeat of orders, a steady drumbeat of new ships being built so that you don't lose these skills after you've spent ages and uh, you know, the time and energy actually building that level of skill base up. The Seifood, in terms of its capacity, in terms of the size of the, the dock, it's, it's probably the only place uh, in these islands you could refit uh, the Queen Elizabeth II, uh, for example, when it comes back in for refit just in a few years' time. But, but what would be wrong with uh, well, sending it off to Norfolk, Virginia and let President Trump's uh, men have a, a go at refitting it? Would that be a great tragedy? Well, there again, I think it comes back to the whole point about maintaining skill bases within the UK and retaining, retaining that capability within the United Kingdom as well. And, you know, Scotland's got a, a strong shipbuilding uh, legacy that you know, has been built up over many, many years. And we're better to uh, refit these ships uh, at the, the best cost uh, and other than other than Resyth. Do you think the MOD ministers really uh, are on top of this issue? Do they understand the, the requirement for having a skill base and capacity to, to refit or build ships in the future? Well, they certainly talk the talk, um, but as we witnessed from the Prime Minister's response, they're not walking the walk. And I think that's the clear message that's coming through from the, the trade unions, for example, in Resyth and other shipyards across, uh, across the country. I, I just feel that you know, there's a, a big opportunity here and it's just slipping through our fingers like, like sand and we, we need to do something about that. And what are the workers saying? What, what are the unions saying to the, the current uh, developing crisis? Well, they, they're obviously concerned about the future. You know, they, they, were, they were given the shipbuilding strategy as a, as a way forward, as a positive uh, way of looking at shipbuilding in the future. One of the few things this government has, has managed to get cross-party support on, uh, yet when it comes to actually delivering, then there's, there's huge gaps in the understanding of ministers to how we can best deliver 
uh, for not just the shipbuilding industry, but the defence and security of the nation. Now, politically, I mean, shipbuilding has always been a hot potato. I mean, I remember, I've got the scars to prove it during the referendum campaign in Scotland of 2014. I remember being told that if Scotland became independent, there'd be no military ships built in Scotland because they'd all be built yeah. in English yards. There must be a certain irony in the Prime Minister telling you that uh, things are out to international tender. The, the three sports ships, for example, uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Chris Stevens, found out just uh, towards the end of uh, the other week there that the, uh, they'll actually have radars and, and armaments on them which actually make them ships of, of war, if you like. They're not just supply ships. So again, on that, on that front as well, it's been shown that the, uh, the government, uh, you know, the policy that they espoused to, to you and the, the people of Scotland in 2014 uh, was just a, a, a load of nonsense and what we need to do is make sure that we hold the government to account uh, and we try and protect as best we can the shipbuilding industry that uh, quite honestly at the moment is being sailed down the river. Well because uh, my own father was uh, served in carriers in the uh in the Second World War, and I, I took him actually to the floating of the mm -hmm. uh, Queen Elizabeth II in, in, in 2014. Uh, and I was very interested, because as in, even it wasn't the official launch, it was a, a floating into, yeah. the, into the dock. But uh, the, the pride of the, the workers uh, it was evident for all to see. The workers from the side predominantly, but representatives from the other yards who'd contributed. So what does it mean you know, to be a, a shipyard worker, having built such a a massive piece of engineering like the Queen Elizabeth II? Well, you, you would know that uh, from your own experience with, with your dad that you know, there is a, a tremendous sense of pride and uh, you know, the very fact they've completed one of the biggest engineering jobs uh, that this, this country has ever, ever produced. You know, and then a few months later to be told that you know, your services are no longer required when uh, in, in reality, you've been told that there's a long-term future for you, for you and your, your job and your family. And I think you know, that, that's really a, a, an unbelievable position to put people in, that you're prepared to uh, you know, pat them on the back in one, one hand and say, well, there's your P45 with, with the other. And you know, that, that it'll be devastating. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure you, your, your father, when he was there at the time as well, felt, felt that they, you know, the sense of pride in the fact that they'd, they'd produced uh, one of the biggest ships uh, the Royal Navy has ever, in fact, the biggest ship the Royal Navy has ever built, and uh, you know that that pride would be felt right through the whole their whole family as well. well it was quite interesting. The Queen Elizabeth II was actually the same size lengthwise as the Indomitable, what my my dad really? served in, which was also refitted in the side, incidentally, right. uh, but much lighter because uh, the the Indomitable was much lighter than the Queen yeah. Elizabeth, uh, and I had uh, many more men. Uh, indeed, my my dad said to one of the the admirals he met, yeah. that, uh, if they were looking for an experienced hand, then he, <laughs> he might be persuaded if the money was right. right. Yeah. But there must be generations of, of people in your constituency who've been part of this process yeah. over, over the years. Mm -hmm. So it's a family and a generational thing, as well as the individual skills of individual workers. In the case of Resyth, for example, they were promised the dreadnought uh, or the, the nuclear submarine refits, uh, you know, um, probably 10, 15 years ago now. Uh, and they, they, at that time, because they didn't get that contract, the whole community was devastated. But they pulled themselves up by the bootstraps and thinking, you know, there's the, we've, we've got a strong future here. And every member of the family would be thinking, you know, I want to be an apprentice. Or, uh, I'm really proud of my, my dad and my mum who have, have been part of this process. Uh, and, you know, to, to again, to be uh, really let down in this way uh, is, is really a bit of a kick in the teeth to the community. Recyth will continue, but uh, at this moment in time, they need a lot of help and a lot of support. Um, and of course, uh, Babcock, uh, who, who, who ran the, uh, the yard once, told me that if you tried to build a facility like Recyth now, mm -hmm. which is basically built into the River Forth, yeah. uh, then you'd be talking 10 billion construction mm -hmm. costs. You know, it'd be a massive construction project. Yes. Which means, of course, it's a 10 billion asset. Uh, any minister who, is, who knows their budget is strapped for cash in almost every aspect of the, the budget at the moment, the defence budget at the moment. You know, you're not going to try and find 10 billion pounds to spend on a, uh, on a, a, a dockyard that you, you know that, that asset already exists elsewhere, i.e. in Resyth. So why, why build and make an investment of 10 billion pounds when that money can be better spent? Uh, on something that would be of a, a absolute value Douglas to the Chapman, MP. as the local MP, it, 
is Resive going to win through? I certainly hope so. I think we can put forward a real good campaign. I'm already working with the trade unions uh, and other MPs from other yards to make sure that uh, shipbuilding is secured. Everything that was in the shipbuilding strategy, we can build on that and make sure the government understands how important it is to make sure that uh, we keep uh, shipbuilding in the likes of the Scythe and Govan and Scots and, and all the other yards across the UK. Well, Douglas Chapman, we wish you well. Now, not uh, Resife made, but uh, still <laughs> well made. This is the Alex Salmon Quay. Right. I don't have to tell you the drill. You know what no. goes in it, you know where the whiskey goes. Thanks very much. It will be well used, I can assure you. And just Thank your you friends. Much. Thank you. Thank you. Despite the decline of shipbuilding in the 20th century, the pull of the great yards in the shipbuilding communities exerted a great pull over the political and social life of the country. It was from Yarrow the hunger marches started which galvanised opinion against the depression of the 1930s. It was on the Upper Clyde that the work started which saw Jimmy Reid lead his workmates to a historic victory and blew the Tory government of Edward Heath off course. Harland and Wolfe hasn't built a ship for years, but the Titanic exhibition has transformed visitor attractions in Northern Ireland. We all would like to live once again in a world where generations of highly skilled families welded pride in their communities and their country where ships from the Clyde held a nation in their holds. However, is this a world we have lost, or can it be reclaimed in the 21st century? Is British shipbuilding going to be confined to the declining markets of complex military ships, specialist and profitable, but limited in scale? Or can it break free once again to become a major player on the world stage of commercial shipping? Next week, we talk to people in the industry who say that shipbuilding could be the comeback kid of the 21st century industry. Be sure to join us. So from Alex, me and all of the team here at the Alex Salmon Show, we'll see you next week.